And so I have um, this quick little presentation. I also shared it with Amram so that this way you guys will have access to it. Um, but also if you have any questions about the laser cutter, let me not walk too far from the microphone. This is my email address. Feel free to email me with any questions you might have about this project. Um, and I'm just gonna go over a little bit about 3D printing and what that is and how it works. And then also laser cutting and what that is. Um, so how a 3D printer works, and you guys maybe are pretty familiar with 3D printers depending on like what high school you went to or just what your interests were kind of growing up, um, is we import a 3D model. Typically we're gonna have a file type of what's called an STL, but there's also OBJ files, object files. They work pretty well with 3D printers. And then it gets imported into what's called a slicer. Cura is the one that we particularly use. And this then is gonna take this 3D object and it's going to bring it down or slice it into the layers that's gonna build up your object. There are primarily three main types of 3D printing technologies out there. The one that is most familiar and most people think of when they think of 3D printers is called fused deposition modeling, where you have a string of plastic or filament, and then it is heated up and it is just squeezed out or extruded out of a nozzle, and then it is just laid down layer by layer by layer and builds up. There are two other technologies though that people sometimes use but don't use as much. One being SLA, which is um, a, essentially you have a vat of goop or resin, and then a laser comes in and hardens it and it lifts it up so it builds it up this way instead of your piece starts here and then the plate lifts up versus with this one, your plate is always staying stationary and the nozzle is gonna be the piece that's lifting up. Um, this will create a much better looking 3D print and there's actually really cool technologies with SLA um, where you could do like flexible prints, you could do dental work prints with it, um, just really cool stuff going within it. You can even print in a ceramic slurry so that way like if you wanted to like make parts for like a rocket ship, you could 3D print them out. Um, and then the oldest form of um, 3D printing is called SLS or selective laser sintering and that's where you kind of have a big giant container of sand and a laser comes in and sinters and fuses those particles of sand together and then you go dig it out of there like an archeologist. Um, this is a way that's really cool because it's completely waste free. So, but it's also stupid expensive. So Formlabs is one of the big companies out there that people um, like, but you can see here, this is an SLS printer at its base level is 28 grand. So you, you, you could get a brand new Honda or you could get this 3D printer and it's too small to make your own Honda, unfortunately. Um, but with this, again, all of that sand that's sitting there in that vat, you could just keep reusing and recycling as you dig your parts out. So this way you have absolutely no waste. Um, with an SLA printer, Formlabs actually makes a pretty good SLA printer that's relatively affordable. Um, and when I say that, it's $2,500. So like, would I be buying it tomorrow? No, but that's not stupid, crazy expensive, but you have all of these bridges or supports. That's gonna be waste product for it. And then FDM printers are gonna be your cheapest option. Um, you could get a great one. These Creality printers are fantastic. This is one of the ones we have down in the lab for 200 bucks. And it is a fantastic printer. I cannot hype these printers up. This sometimes has waste, sometimes doesn't um, for it. Now, Things you can use to make 3D models or make something for um, to 3D print. SketchUp is something you guys are all familiar with. You've all at least had exposure to SketchUp. It wouldn't be the software I would recommend to 3D print something, but again, you have like that familiarity. It's actually no longer free for 30 days. They only have a seven day trial now, um, but then they do have a $55, so it's discounted for students. We also have it on every single computer that's in this building. Um, but 
sometimes spaces get kind of inverted and a little wacky and wonky. Since you guys all had to model something in SketchUp before in 1728, mm -hmm. you're probably familiar with how it can be a little frustrating sometimes to work with. Um, a software that I love for 3D modeling is Fusion 360. So if you have an Autodesk account, which you had to make to be able to download AutoCAD or Revit, um, Fusion 360 is also completely free. It has a Mac version, and the Mac version is identical to the Windows version, which is also really nice. Um, and this is a 3D software that I love. There's also a lot of other ones out here, and so I have a couple of them linked. Blender, Blender's totally free. I've never used Blender before in my life. I downloaded it, and then I never even opened it. So I can't speak to how good or bad it is, but there's loads of videos out there for it. Rhino, I have used Rhino. Rhino is expensive though to um, work with, and it is, it is something that you definitely need tutorials to help you with. You cannot pick it up on your own, because, or at least I couldn't. Um, there's loads of other things out there, so really like whatever 3D modeling software you feel most comfortable with is the one you could use. Um, there's even quite a few that are web-based now that people really like and use, and I don't care which software you model with, as long as it's something that you can export as an STL file with, then it's something that we can 3D print um, out. Um, so preparing something to 3D print, if that's the option you want to do, is export it to an STL file. Keep in mind the final dimensions you want, especially if you are modeling your wind turbine to be one meter long. We don't have a printer that has the capacity to print something that size. So you'll have to just keep in mind of when you're shrinking it down for your model, how big do you want it to be? We'll put it into our slicing software, which would either be Maker Print or Ultimaker Cura. Um, maybe I need to make more than one part. We can duplicate them. And then we can even change some of those print settings. We'll pick a color. I don't have many beautiful colors to pick out, and I did that intentionally because it gets annoying when you guys are really picky about things. So I picked out a bunch of very ugly beige colors. Um, and then we send it to the printer. A lot of people have a misconception of 3D printing and they think that it's gonna be like instantaneous and like I send this to the printer and it's done like in 10 minutes and you just giggled because I'm sure you've probably 3D printed something before. And it's sometimes, sometimes it is like a two, three day print depending on what you're doing. Um, there are some, there are a couple of things I've made. I used to teach at a high school and I, for 3D printing, we would always, I start them off with making keychains. And like their keychains would take 20, 30 minutes to print out. But sometimes it is like a 10 hour, 23 hour print for it. Um, so we don't sit there and stick around and wait for the printer to finish. I just will email you when it's done and where you can go pick it up for it. Um, some examples of 3D printing too that, um, I've done before and worked with students before. This was a cool one where um, this foods teacher wanted these custom cookie cutters made. And so at Wataga High School, we took the Wataga logo and we made these cookie cutters and they also then imprinted like little designs onto the cookies. This was a sculpture I made based off of a mathematician. His name's George Hart and he does all these really cool math sculptures. Um, and so this is all just the same piece repeating over and over. And it was very annoying to try to get the last piece in there. Um, other things too, I really like 3D printing stuff with practical applications for it. So this was a friend was something to do with their motorcycle. And like if this holds like all of the cords and the handlebars together. Um, and he was getting ready to have it casted in metal. That's a very expensive process to do. So we wanted to just verify that everything was the right size and gonna work correctly. So we 3D printed out the pieces first so that way you could test it out on the motorcycle before sending it away to get casted. And this is just a, the printer in working through something. So with the MakerBot one, the bed lifts up and then as it goes, the bed will slowly lift down and down as that nozzle just deposits things with it. Um, other things 3D printed, so this was a architectural model. This entire shipping container was 3D printed for it. Um, and you can even see a little bit here and here, it's like a little bit discolored or shiny. And that's because the printer wasn't large enough to print this whole thing. 
but since it was printed in an ABS plastic, we actually were able to use acetone to fuse these two pieces together because ABS is gonna melt in acetone. So we dipped the ends in it and then put them together and then held them there with like some clamps for a while. And then it became one big piece. And this was another little architectural model um, in which these columns holding up these gas station awnings were 3D printed out for it. So it's got a couple of uses. Um, some considerations for when you're 3D printing is if you have moving parts, most of the time we have to print them separately. If we try to model everything as just one big assembly, they're not actually going to move and it's not going to work well. Um, so we usually um, print stuff out um, individually. There are some printers out there in which they have like dissolvable supports. So you could even like 3D print a ball bearing and then just get rid of the supports and you could have all of those balls in there um, moving around. We do not have one of those printers. Um, and if you are really good at 3D modeling, you can even model things where you can have breakable supports built into it. So you can make like, have you ever seen those like fidget toys where it's like a little slug? that you can like move around and everything and it makes that big rattling noise that irks me a little bit, but somebody else might really like. Um, those just have like buildable, breakable supports in them. Um, your print size is also something you've got to consider. The biggest I could print something would be 11 and a half inches by seven and a half inches. Um, that's with our MakerBot printer, which isn't our better printer. Um, and even then, like the front of the bed, usually stuff doesn't adhere well to it. So it's more like 10 by six inches is the biggest I could print something. Um, and then how we orient it on the bed is also gonna be a big consideration, which I thought I had on the next slide, but I guess I don't. Um, and so that's just sometimes if like you were making a shape that's like a T, for example, it would make way more sense for just to lay it down flat because if I printed it up standing upright, there's gonna be all of this support that's just waste that I'm gonna have to just get rid of or ditch. Um, but usually I'm gonna be taking care of loading it into the machine and putting it on that bed. And so I'm gonna make some decisions and choices for you just to conserve material and conserve time with it. Um, any notes you wanna add for 3D printing? No. Okay. A lot of students don't use the 3D printing option for this project, but um, the one note that I do remember from last semester was you said they could shrink it down to fit. How do you use these 1D lines? Like I have to know the, uh, I need the line base for uh, at least one of the test tubes, and I have all the spot plug, I have all my alignment, but there's a 1D plug there, I will go to the test tube, and then I put that into 3D printer and try to see that it's made to Um, the other option we have is the laser cutter or etcher, depending on how you want to call it. Um, you really could take anything. I could take a photo of you guys right now and I could go burn it onto any material or most materials that I want. It's not going to turn out well. It's going to look really bad, but I could do it if I wanted to. Um, most of the time, if you want to cut something though, you have to design a 2D vector. And that could be an AutoCAD file, a DWG file, or it could be um, an SVG. So they do have 3D printers and laser cutters in the library, um, they, all the way in the basement. They've got their own little makerspace. They use Glowforge lasers, um, which I believe take SVG files. I use a BOSS laser and we use DXF files, which come from AutoCAD. Um, so uh, there's a difference between different companies and just how some of the software works. So if you want to cut something out, you have to have a pathway for it to follow. So you have to have some type of vector for it to follow. Um, we also need to like lay our pieces out and plan accordingly for how we want stuff laid out. Depending on the material we're cutting out of, we need a different speed and a different power. Because if I'm trying to cut through a quarter inch piece of plywood, I'm gonna need a lot more power 
than if I was trying to cut through a piece of foam board or even a piece of paper. We can, it's delicate enough that you can cut paper. We can even perforate paper too to do cool bendy stuff. We've been playing around with that a lot this semester. Um, so we need to adjust our speed and our power accordingly. And then we also need to make sure that we are present in the room while the laser is running. No one should ever, ever leave the laser unattended because bad things could potentially happen. They shouldn't, but they could. So we never ever wanna leave a laser just running without anyone around for it. Um, now to prepare a file to cut, I have a couple of links in here. This one is actually, I recorded it um, a couple of days ago in which it's me going through the process of taking one of these Excel files for your wind turbines and how you can take that and just like put it straight into AutoCAD. And I'll even do a little demo of that right now live, but I figured it would be helpful if you had a video to refer to later on for it. <laughs> he says, he says, thank you so much. Um, and I found out how to do this through some Polish AutoCAD forum. So shout out to that random Polish man who taught me how to do this. Um, because I had no idea you could do that with an Excel file and I thought that's so cool. And it's line work, it's workable line work um, with it. So I have that link right in here. Um, you could design your wind turbines in any software you like. I would say AutoCAD is the most convenient, but I've also been using AutoCAD for about 20 years of my life. So that's why I usually gravitate towards it because it's what I know. So I got good at it and then I used it more and I got better at it. And there's probably better software out there now in 2024, but I, I like using my AutoCAD. Um, we'll lay it out on our piece. So I usually will create a box, just a rough box to represent um, the material size that I'm cutting on. I do have some scrap pieces of like chipboard and foam board down in that lab. And you guys are welcome to any of the scraps. So if you don't wanna go buy material for it, um, you can. Um, Chipboard is usually a really good option, and so is like balsa wood or basswood, and like a 30 by 40 inch piece of chipboard at Hobby Lobby is I believe $3.99. And even then, a couple of you could go in on it the same piece and then only pay a dollar each for it. Um, but we wanna lay out our piece. We also wanna make sure we remove any overlaps, which I don't think I did in here. Maybe I did. No, I didn't, awesome, so I can even show you how to do that. That's the piece we're about to go cut. Um, if you have overlapping lines, it could be a problem, it could not be a problem. Because like, what's gonna happen in here is the laser's gonna go over and cut this line, but then it's gonna go over it again. Because I have a line, but then if I hover over it and click it, I actually have two lines sitting there. Potentially, depending on the material I'm cutting, that could be a problem because if the laser goes over the same spot, that material could potentially catch fire. Um, it's usually not gonna like, it's not gonna be a big explosion or anything. It's just gonna sort of ember and then eat up the rest of my piece. But that's also something I don't want happening because now my material's wasted, my time was wasted. And there is in the back of the laser bed, there's a big canister of CO2. That's how the laser runs. And if I have a smoldering fire here, probably don't want that happening, which is why we don't leave the laser unattended um, for it. So we wanna make sure if we have any overlaps that we remove said overlaps um, from it. And then we wanna save our file in AutoCAD as a DXF. And so this is just a YouTube video of me going over the overkill process for those um, overlaps. And then here's another video of me showing how to save something as a DXF file in AutoCAD. We can't import a DWG, the basic AutoCAD drawing, but in DXF is an exchangeable file, so then we can import that. Um, so these are just three videos to help you with your project. Um, a couple of considerations for it. Some materials I cannot laser cut. I cannot cut through metal. The, this machine does not cut through metal. You would need a plasma cutter for that, which we don't have in this building yet. Maybe one day we'll get one and it'll be cool. Um, some other materials, some plastics are just really dangerous to set on fire and I'm not gonna breathe that in and I'm not gonna subject you to breathe that in. Um, so if you're unsure of what material you wanna cut, um, just a quick Google search to see if it's cuttable will work. This is also a list 
from Boss Laser, the company we got our laser from, uh, the materials that they are they have approved cutting, and then it's also where I get information about like what power and what speed I'm gonna cut with for it. Now, what's fun is they give us suggestions for a 105 watt laser, they give us suggestions for 155 watt, we have a 120 watt laser. So sometimes I have to make educated choices in here of just like, okay, I need something between 20 and 15, I'm gonna go with 17. So sometimes I'm just making a, an educated guess. That's the whole real trick of academia is it's just a lot of educated guesses. Um, so just keep in mind what material you wanna do. Um, there are a few examples on that table back there. Um, foam board, like white presenter foam board works great. Cardboard is a fantastic material to cut. Um, chipboard or plywood, if it's wood, I would recommend an eighth of an inch or thinner. Um, balsa wood, basswood work great. Chip, I said chipboard already, didn't I? Those are kind of my go-tos is chipboard, foam board, and like basswood are the ones, and cardboard. I love cardboard too. I like how it smells when I cut it. It smells like a campfire. Um, so just make sure you've got your material in order. Printer size, we have a gigantic laser cutter. So our print bed is 55 inches by 35 inches. So as long as your material is smaller than that, we'll be able to fit it into the printer. Um, and so, you're gonna see how funny it is in that room because this thing is gigantic. When we ordered it, I was told that we were getting a two foot by three foot printer. And when this thing got delivered, we had to take it apart and put it on its side to get it through the door because we couldn't fit it into the room because it's gigantic. Um, and then also to just prepare your stuff ahead of time. So this link, is just a playlist of all of the videos I've made related to the laser. So it has that Excel one. It has um, removing lines, saving something as a DXF. So I've got all of those in here. Um, but then I also have like other just general, any single time I find something cool to do with it, I'll just put a video in this playlist for it. Um, there's also loads of other people in playlists that you can go to and explore. I am not the only person who knows how to use a laser cutter in the world. Um, and much of what I've learned, I learned off of other people on YouTube as well um, for it. Um, if you need to fix or adjust your file in any way, shape, or form, um, I will like let you know. And depending on how severe the fix might be, I just may do, do it myself. Because um, what typically happens with this project, this is the third semester we're doing this now, what usually happens is you guys all wait until the day before it's due to cut them out. And then you have to make an appointment for a time to use the laser cutter. And if your file isn't ready, you're potentially then gonna eat into the next person's time and the next person's time and the next person's time. So if you don't have like your file ready to go, I very well might just cancel your appointment and say like you need to figure out what, what you need to do and then reschedule or go to the, like the library for it um, just to be like respectful of the schedule and the time who of the people who are coming after you. Um, other little considerations. So this was some like tower project an architecture student was working on. I know it's a little hard to see on the screen so I, I apologize for that. I tried to make the background darker and that didn't really help much. Um, but this was the file they originally sent me. And what we wound up printing was this, because you can actually save, you don't save that much time cutting, and we saved about like 13 seconds in total with the cut, but we were able just to conserve so much material, because this is just all waste, 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 waste. Um, versus this, we're creating so much less waste with our laser cut. Um, and as sustainable tech students, I'm hoping you guys at least have a small concern for creating just a bunch of waste that's gonna go into a, a dumpster. Um, so just trying to group or move parts as close together as possible. Here's like another option that we could have done where then we're even like sharing edges to create a little bit less waste. Gonna be really hard to do with a wind turbine, but um, just trying to keep everything as condensed as possible. 
So here are some examples too of what students did with their turbine blades um, when they imported them in. So just trying to condense them so that this way you're using a heck of a lot less material um, when it comes to the cut. And then we've also got, um, this one was being printed on two pieces. So you'll see in this print, as well as this one, they've got this big box, which essentially is representing the size of the piece of material they bought. So that way they can make sure that their piece is gonna fit on it. Um, this one, the student just had two pieces of material that they wanted to print on. So that's why they've got a couple of different size boxes um, for it. A couple of examples of some cool stuff that we did, that I've done with the laser cutters. So some of these are architectural models. This was actually um, a product design. It was for a litter box. So like, still a, still a cool little model. Um, this is another one of those George Hart sculptures. I just find his sculptures really cool and I like making them because I'm a nerd. And this is one of those tower structures. Um, all of the stuff in this architectural model was laser cut out um, for it. This greenhouse was all laser cut. This lamp design, which was then intended to have like a fabric meshed over it, but then this skeleton would still kind of show through. So just cool things that you can do with it. Um, so now, if you want to use the laser cutter or the 3D printer, the first thing you have to do is fill out this form. And I've got it linked in this presentation and you're getting a copy of it. And I've also got a QR code here. There's a QR code posted on the laser door. There's a QR code posted on my office door. Or if you email me, I will be happy to send you the link to the form. Um, but we just have this form right here. This is just how I keep track of what the laser is being used for and like how often it's being used. Um, one note is that the, our laser is meant to be used for academic purposes. So I'll allow sometimes stuff for personal projects, but if you have something that really isn't for a class, you can go to the library and I have got linked here, their website as well. Um, from talking with them, they really don't care what you're making with their 3D printers or laser cutter. As long as you're not making something like offensive or like a part for a firearm, they really don't care what you're doing with it, which is pretty nice. Um, they do have a policy though that if you are hogging the machines, they will ask you to like leave and come back because other students also need to use the machines um, for it. Um, so nothing for a business venture in there. If you're unsure about your CAD file or how to work with it, I have linked here my office hours. We could set up a Zoom appointment. You can come to my office. I can help you with your CAD work. If you, if you are able to kind of describe the problem you're having via email, I could just also answer your question that way. I'm happy to help you if you ask for help. Um, or just email me. Um, check your work and make sure it's what you intended to do. Rule of thumb for setting up your AutoCAD file is the color red is gonna be a line that cuts. The color blue would be like a design that gets etched in there, which maybe you have, maybe you don't. Um, some students in the past on like these ones, they put numbers on the pieces just to help make it assemble a little bit easier. So they'll etch it so that way they know which piece is number one, two, three, four. Because when you go to take these out of the machine, you're just going to have a big mess of a pile, and you may not know how they go to how you intend to have them go together. Um, so I just make a red line if it's cut, a blue line if it's an etch, and then a white line is just something that isn't cutting out at all. This isn't set in stone for how the laser works. It's just the rule of thumb that I use. Um, it has to get submitted in this form as a DXF, an Illustrator file, or an SVG. If it needs work, I may email you telling you what needs to get changed, or again, I may just cancel your appointment if it's like you just submitted like an empty AutoCAD file to me. Um, and then this is a link to that YouTube playlist. Personal projects, I do let you do personal projects, things outside of class, depending on like what it is. I've done like somebody wanted to like engrave a cutting board for their dad for their birthday. And so I was like, yeah, sure. Um, but just know that if you do, or if you're doing a personal project and then I have a student who emails me about something for a class, I may 
cancel you or poison or move you because the the purpose for academic projects should come before your personal things. Um, I might also just totally deny your personal project depending on what it is. Um, and that's just up to me to decide like, no, I'm, I, we're not gonna do that with this printer. But again, you have access to laser cutters through the library. So I'm not telling you you can't do anything. I'm just saying you can't do it here. Um, and then after you submit the Google form, you're gonna make an appointment. This is that same calendar here. Um, I have a pretty wide amount of availability and I will towards, when is this assignment gonna be due for them? Hmm? Okay, because what I'll start, I'll open up a few like Friday slots too, but I have, I have availability every single day at least um, during the week. I try to keep it pretty open for it. Um, it's essentially just whenever I'm not teaching, I've got availability here. Sometimes though I do go home on occasion. My apologies. I do occasionally go home and eat dinner. Um, and the form's pretty straightforward. It's just asking, who are you? Who are you making this for? What is the instructor's name? Give me a general description of what you're making. When do you need it done by? What are you cutting it out of? What is the size of the piece of material you're using? How thick is that material you're using? And then you're just gonna upload your file onto here um, for it. And then if you have any questions, and when you hit submit, It'll say, cool, thank you for your response, and then it will also give you a link again to this calendar for you to remind you to make an appointment to sign up for it. Um, so you need to fill out that form. You also need to reserve an appointment time. If you wanna use the 3D printer, the form is pretty much exactly the same, um, but there's no time slot you need to reserve because again, we're just gonna load it into the printer and I'll just let you know when it's done. Um, but again, it's gonna just say, it's got my little disclaimers at the top, and then this is pretty much mostly the same questions that are going on in here for the 3D printer. Here's my wonderful color choices. You do have the option to just say, I don't care what color. I don't know if that's gonna be part of the grade is if it's printed in green or not. Um, and then I'll load it in and I'll let you know like what time it's gonna be ready to get picked up. I believe that's yes, that's the last slide in here. Any questions before I do just a quick little like AutoCAD demo in here then? Any general, yeah? I guess like for this project, would it be more effective to just use the laser cutter? I personally would say yes. I think it would be easier, but that's my opinion. I'm wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> I'm wrong all the time, but I think the laser is a little easier. Um, there's some things from here in this that aren't really described or shown like with the laser. So like, for example, like where is that hole gonna go um, and that's something that I can't help with like guidance on where should this hole be put on all of these because um, I'll be honest I have no idea what any of this is um, the cool thing I found out is I don't have to because you could just go in here and it changes it for you so this is one of those airfoil Excel sheets um, that I was sent like a year ago. Um, one little note though that makes it a little hard to bring these into AutoCAD, and I do mention this in the video um, that's in that presentation, is that if I was to change this core to 600, the chart updates size with it, and so therefore like importing it into AutoCAD, you really are just bringing in the same size piece every single time, which isn't great. And so what you do have to do first is 
click on the axis and then right click to format it and you need to get rid of this auto format. So like I would set the cord to the largest size that you're gonna have, which I'm gonna say 600. I don't know if that would be the largest size I would have or not, but um, this is my pretend make-believe wind turbine. And then I'm just going to format these axes to just have a constant minimum of negative 80. So I'm just gonna add a new zero there. Since that says reset, I've pretty much made that just always gonna be negative 80 and a constant maximum of 80. So now when I change the size, it's not gonna change. And I'm gonna do the same thing with my X axis here, is I just wanna make these, and I've just been, I just add a zero at the end. As long as these say reset, which should happen now, probably won't since I'm doing a live demo. But yeah, so what should happen now is when I change the size, the chart is gonna stay the exact same size. My blade profile is gonna change or size each. Um, so then what you wanna do to bring this in here as you change your cords is you're just gonna control C to copy it. But then when you go in AutoCAD, you wanna do a special paste which is paste spec. When you do a paste spec, you can bring what you're pasting in, which is this airfoil, as an AutoCAD entity, and then I can place it in here. And now it is line work that I can actually sit and use and work. I do have to do a little bit of work, like I've gotta delete this all of this chart stuff. Is there potentially a way to bring it in without the chart? Probably but I'm just gonna like delete all that chart stuff. And then I would go and change my cord size to my next size, control C, and then back in AutoCAD, paste spec. And then as an AutoCAD and next one, again, I've gotta delete my chart from the background. I'm sure you could format that in Excel to not bring the chart in with it if you maybe make all of that stuff hidden or disappear. I don't find that incredibly cumbersome. Um, there's still a little bit of like prep work and stuff I would have to do. Like I would need to get rid of that line in the middle. So for this guy, I would need to explode him. Delete it all out. Um, and then I would also need to change all of my line work up here to just like the color red, because then that's gonna be something that like cuts. But so the command for AutoCAD would be paste spec, special paste. And we just get all of our line work in here, which I thought, I didn't know that existed until like a year ago. And I was like, that's pretty cool. So it's just a command that you type. I just type in paste spec, and then you could click it from here, or you could finish typing it and hit enter. Yeah? Does most of the draw the holes in the draw, or do they just drill it that one time? Some students just go and manually drill it in, and then some students do draw it. Um, I think it's more based off of like, if you are really sure and like no, and maybe having this line in here for the time being to like measure out where it's going, I believe it goes on a different spot though on each one of them because these rotate and turn a little bit as it goes. Um, so some students just cut out the profiles and then they figure out how they want to adjust it onto their like piece for it. Because that way they've got a little bit more freedom well, there's been a few students too who um, they cut it out with the hole and they are like, when they come to their appointment, they're just like, I don't know if I did that right. And I don't know if you did that right either. <laughs> I was like, I can't give you guidance on that. I was like, I will tell you it's gonna cut a hole. It's like the good news for it. Um, and so that's how you can put them all in there um, to make like an overall bounding box. So I have this box here that this is a 30 by 40 inch box, which is the piece of chipboard that I'm gonna be cutting out of. And then these little cards here are what I'm gonna cut. So I'm just gonna highlight all of them and I'm just gonna turn their color to red. I just only want them cut out. What I'm making here 
not that you care too much about it, but I'm making these little um, cards that uh, Charles and Ray Eames used to make and sell because I'm trying to make a little house project that's based off of these cards, but I'm really struggling with how to really design it and make it look nice in Revit. So what my plan or intention to do is to just actually physically cut a set of these cards so I can play around with it as a physical model and then go into Revit with a better game plan uh, for it. I so, thought I'll just show you one example by Stuart Sadden, but it's not a whole little bit of example. It's not the size you need. You go, uh, let's change the which uh, interlumbar stitch is the, like a rectangle one. You see that? And you cut the hole with the laser so that the, the twist is automatically taken care of. Can you see that? Therefore, it's easier to do in the drawing to make those holes because those holes are gonna tell you whether this has uh, to have uh, like a 30 degree, 18 degree, five degree, then you can drill this hole accordingly so that you don't have to worry about the assembling it together. Just put it through the hole, your angle is taken care of, your twist is taken care of. Therefore, it's a little bit more initial work, but still slow down. Uh, like a, sometimes, like I have in the past, I have done like a one hole at the quarter core. Quarter core means two by four. That's where the center of gravity of the blade is. And the second hole, I will draw up from like an angle and the, like how I want to shape this structural level. That's why it's up to you. Uh, but doing it on the AutoCAD side of the thing saves you a lot of time now. Because it's like you don't have to worry about like. You just need to like just slide it and then, yeah, and twist and take care. Twist is already taken care. Just for your information. Um, the last two things that I'd have to do here is I would have to do what's called an overkill, because as I showed you, I've got like overlapping lines here, and I can tell because right here it says I've got two polylines selected. Um, so I'm just going to highlight my whole thing. And it's a command called overkill. It opened up on my other screen. I usually have it ignore color and layer. And so it's right now says it found 769 objects. And it just erased 28 duplicates. And then it also um, got rid of 264 overlaps. So it really combined everything. So now there's only one line here. And that way the laser can work a little bit faster. Um, so, and then I'm gonna do a save, and I wanna just save my drawing type as a DXF. You can do any of these years, it's not gonna have an effect. Um, and I'm just gonna call mine Eames Cards. And then we would bring it into Lightburn. Now, you guys don't have access to Lightburn because they don't have a university discount or a free student version. So we only have two copies of Lightburn um, as a department. One of them lives on my laptop and then the other lives on the desktop that the laser runs. Um, but this is the laser software essentially. Uh, and one of the, you can draw everything manually in here, but I rarely don't because I'm very good with AutoCAD. So then I'm just gonna go into import I'll go up to my quick axis because it'll be right here. And then I can just bring my file in here. Um, and so it just brings it in as line work. Over here is where I can set my speed and my power. So for, since I'm gonna be cutting this out of a piece of chipboard, I'm aware that I need a speed of 55 and a power of 40. Um, that's just something that I have memorized because I cut so much chipboard, um, but there's also posted in the laser room, I have like recommended speeds and powers for materials that we often cut. Um, and I can also do a little preview in here to see how long this is gonna take. So this is gonna be an eight minute total print. It's just gonna go through and just cut out each piece. It does kind of come up with some random pathway that sometimes makes sense, sometimes doesn't. Um, if I turn optimized cut path off, I wonder how long it's going to take. Nine minutes. But re in reality, I actually would prefer this instead of it just going all over. I'll take the extra minute for it to not be so sporadic. 
Um, and then this is ready to go, go on to the laser. So you're just going to send me the DXF file. And then when it's your time, you can either, I'll, I can walk you through the process of setting this part up yourself. Or if you just really don't care about it or are interested in it all too much, I'm happy to just set the file up for you. Um, I don't mind that. No, not everyone has to be interested in this. I'm interested in enough for it for the both of us. But I have a feeling some of you might be, because it's kind of cool. We get to set something on fire. With that, I'm going to stop the recording because I'm about to talk about arson.